Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Shaw Prize Lecture in Life Science and Medicine. I'm Agnes Lam, Year Three student from HKUSD, majoring in Global Business and Management. Your MC for today. Today, we're honored to have Professor Scott D. Emmer, the 2021 Shaw Laureate in Life Science and Medicine, to deliver a lecture to us. It's also my pleasure to introduce Professor Guo Yu Song, the moderator of today. Professor Guo Yu Song is the Associate Professor of the Division of Lab Science at HKUST. The Shaw Prize is an international award established under the auspices of the late Mr. Run Run Shaw to honor individuals to, who have achieved distinguished and significant advances in scientific research. It consists of three annual prizes, astronomy, lab science and medicine, and mathematical sciences. Each prize carries a monetary award of $1.2 million US dollars. My first invites Professor Guo to say a few words of welcome. I would like to extend my warmest welcome to all of you at today's Shaw Prize lecture in life science and medicine to be given by Professor Scott D. Emmer. Frank H. D. Rose, class of 1956, Professor of Molecular Biology and Genetics, and the director of the Will Institute for Cell and Molecular Biology, Cornell University. Professor Emmer is a winner of the 2021 Shell Prize in Life Science and Medicine. The Shell Prize is one of the most prestigious prizes that can be bestowed to a researcher. Winning it, it is a testament of the immense achievements of Professor Emmer, one of the most influential scientists of our time. Professor Emmer won the Shell Prize for his groundbreaking discovery of the escort pathway. The escort pathway, the full name is and the thermal sorting complex required for transport pathway is essential in diverse processes involving membrane biology, cell division, cell surface receptor regulation, viral dissemination, nerve, nerve axon pruning. These processes are essential to life, health, and disease. In a landmark series of studies, Professor Emmer used elegant yeast genetic strategies that enabled him to identify over a dozen genes that his group named as escort pathway. Utilizing molecular biology, biochemical, and structural approaches, Professor Emmer's lab characterized these escort proteins and elucidated their individual and combined roles. In today's lecture, Professor Emmer will tell us their research team's efforts on uncovering this amazing molecular machinery and elucidating how the escort machinery perform its cellular function. Before I pass the time to our distinguished speaker, I would like to thank the Shell Prize for bringing the Shell Prize lectures to our university every year. These lectures provide golden opportunities to meet great minds and be enlightened firsthand. I'm very delighted to see students, scholars, and other participants from across the world are here with us in this lecture. I'm sure all of you will walk away today filled with inspirations and aspirations for higher goals. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my great honor to present Professor Scott D. Emmer, one of the world's greatest and foremost scientists and the Shell Prize Laureate in Life Science and Medicine. Thank you, Professor Guo. May I now invite Professor Emmer and Professor Guo for a virtual group photo, please. Please look at the camera and we'll capture this special moment in a count of three. Three, two, one, cheers. Please hold for one more photo. Again, three, two, one, cheers. Thank you, everyone. Professor Emmer will not deliver his lecture. After the lecture, Professor Guo will host a Q&A session. If you have any questions during the presentation, please drop them in the Q&A box. Professor Emmer, please. It is an honor to present the Shaw Prize lecture describing our work on the lysosome. The title of my lecture is Falling in Love with Genetics, Escorting Proteins into the Lysosome. 
Before I describe our science, I want to recognize and acknowledge a few key individuals in my career. My graduate mentor was Tom Silhavi, and my postdoctoral mentor was Randy Sheckman. These individuals opened my eyes to the power of genetics, and they taught me how to think like a geneticist and how to use genetics to solve key problems in cell biology. I'm indebted to both of them. Beyond the science, both of them are lifelong friends and have supported me throughout my career. I also want to recognize the many graduate students and postdoctoral fellows who have worked in my lab during the almost 40 years that I have had a lab. Uh, these individuals did the work that I'll be describing, and although I can't recognize them individually, I am very grateful for all they've done in the lab. Many of the projects represent teamwork where several individuals participated in the work. Among the first uh, 20 or so years of the lab was this group of students and postdocs, and then more recently, this second group of postdocs and students. Indeed, I count these individuals as my greatest legacy in science. I want to step back in time a little, back to the early days when modern cell biology was just beginning. And two individuals, Keith Porter and George Bellotti, were key figures in starting what we now know as modern cell biology. These individuals developed electron microscopy techniques to peer into, into cells. Keith Porter said, our initial reason for wanting to study cells with the greater resolution of electron microscopy was simply to see what there might be in the optically empty parts of the protoplasm or cytoplasm. Using standard light microscopy, one can see cells but cannot visualize the internal structures in the cells. However, with the techniques that they developed using high resolution and high magnification electron microscopy, they could develop images where one could look at the cytoplasm and see a wealth of membrane-enclosed structures and organelles. And one of these organelles that Christian de Duve in 1955 was able to purify and characterize is the lysosome. He discovered the acidic lysosome and lysosomal hydrolases and in 1974 was awarded the Nobel Prize for that work. We have been interested in the lysosome in cells, and we have used the yeast cell as our model genetic system. Both human cells and yeast cells have a similar complement of organelles, including the lysosome. However, yeast have a much simpler genome. They grow rapidly and are easy to manipulate both by molecular biology and genetic techniques. So we used yeast as a system to study the lysosome and its biogenesis. In the electron microscope, the lysosome in yeast, often referred to as the vacuole, is easy to visualize. It's much larger than the lysosome in human cells. Human cells have hundreds of small lysosomes, whereas in yeast, the lysosome is a large structure, about 400 to 500 nanometers. And as I've already described, the lysosome is an acidic compartment. It has low pH, and it contains numerous acid hydrolases. It is a degradative organelle that can degrade proteins, lipids, and other molecules. These macromolecules are degraded to their constituents, like amino acids, and those can be recycled out of the lysosome back into the cytoplasm for reuse. The lysosome is a, is a quality control organelle because it turns over proteins that have been damaged, as well as organelles that are damaged or non-functional. And in this way, the cell can renew itself by getting rid of these damaged structures. If they do accumulate, it can be toxic. And indeed, in humans, there are more than 50 known inherited lysosomal storage disorders, in which individuals are born with defects in any one of a number of different lysosomal hydrolases. These result in severe disease and neurological defects, as well as bone and muscle defects. And some of these you've probably heard of, like Tay-Sachs disease and Gaucher's disease. So understanding the lysosome and its biogenesis is of critical importance. In my talk, I'm going to break it up into three parts. And the first part is the genetic isolation of vacuole or protein sorting mutants, or VPS mutants. I want to introduce you briefly 
to the, the kinds of genetic approaches that we have used over the past 40 years to dissect this problem. So the basic enzyme that we used as our model in the system is a protease called carboxypeptidase Y. And we can monitor its trafficking and synthesis within the cell through a pulse labeling technique in which we use radioactive amino acids to label briefly for 10 minutes and then chase with non-radioactive amino acids to observe the conversion to a mature form. And like other secreted proteins in the cell, this, the CPY is initially translocated into the lumen of the endoplasmic reticulum. It then traffics through the Golgi and is sorted to the endosome. And from the endosome, it's delivered to the lysosome or vacuole, where it gets proteolytically cleaved. It undergoes shifts on gel because of, one, its glycosylation. The ER form has modest glycosylation. Those sugars are extended in the Golgi. And in the vacuole, there's a proteolytic clip in which the precursor form is converted to a mature form. Unlike secreted proteins that are transported from the Golgi out of the cell, carboxypeptidase Y traffics from the Golgi through an endosome to the vacuole. In order to characterize this trafficking pathway, we took advantage of an approach called gene fusions. And two postdocs in the lab early on, and I will probably not be able to recognize everyone that has done this work, but I uh, encourage you to check the faces and names of the individuals that are on some of these slides. So carboxypeptidase Y in, gene, in the gene fusion approach is fused to the enzyme invertase. Invertase is normally secreted from cells, whereas CPY goes to the vacuole. And what we found is that if you fuse just the front end or amino terminal end of CPY to invertase, the invertase is still secreted normally. However, by adding a small piece, another 30 or 40 amino acids, to the fusion protein, now invertase is directed to the vacuole. So we can redirect invertase to a new compartment of the cell, which indicates that this piece of carboxypeptidase Y contains the sorting information for this delivery. And we could use this then to identify sequences that are critical for the sorting reaction. But more importantly, we could use invertase as a selection tool in genetics. And so what we did to select these VPS mutants was take advantage of the fact that when the CPY invertase fusion is sorted to the vacuole, invertase is no longer available outside the cell to hydrolyze sucrose to its sugars, glucose, and fructose that normally would be uh, transported into the cell. In this strain, these cells are SUC minus, unable to metabolize sucrose. But we could simply isolate SUC plus mutants, that is cells that were defective in sorting the fusion protein to the vacuole and instead secreted it out of the cell where it hydrolyzes the sucrose and allows it, the SUC glucose and fructose to get in so the cells can grow. And you, one can easily see this growth of the SUC plus mutants on plates, both uh, sucrose plates and on indicator plates, whereas the parent strain is unable to grow. And by using this technique, a graduate student in the lab, uh, two graduate students, uh, Jane Robinson and Lois Banta, were able to isolate and characterize a large number of mutants. Indeed, 500 independent SUCPLUS mutants were isolated and assigned to 33 vacuola protein sorting genes. And we then characterized these genes. Now, they were isolated originally by using a gene fusion approach. However, these mutants also missort carboxypeptidase Y. So in wild-type cells, carboxypeptidase Y is normally sorted to the vacuole and in, in an internal or inside the cell to the mature form. However, in the VPS mutants, the protein is no longer sorted from the Golgi to the endosome, but instead is secreted out of the cell and now it's secreted not in the mature form, but in the P2 precursor, that is the Golgi form. So these mutants are defective in both sorting of the fusion protein as well as wild type carboxypeptidase Y. And so they were candidates for being key functions in driving protein sorting to the vacuole lysosome. To characterize these, Lois Banta in the lab 
did electron microscopy analysis of representative mutants in all 33 of the genes. And we divided those mutants into three morphological classes, class A, B, and C, by morphological analysis. The class A mutants look very much like wild-type cells. They have a normal-looking vacuole. The class B mutants had fragmented or multiple smaller vacuoles that accumulated, and the class C mutants didn't, no longer had a vacuole that could be identified and were the most severe and grew very slowly. By grouping them into these categories, it helped us understand the genetic functions of these different genes. Another lab at the University of Oregon, Tom Stevens, doing parallel studies using a different approach, also isolated mutations in vacuola protein sorting. And when we uh, shared our mutants and compared them, it defined over 40 genes in yeast that re were required for this process. In my lab, by 1993, we had cloned and sequenced representative genes from each the class A, the class B, and the class C. And I'll not be able to go through in detail any of these. Uh, however, I want to touch on two of the mutants that were in the class A, VPS15, which encodes a protein kinase, and VPS34, which encodes a lipid kinase. And so very briefly in the second part, I want to discuss how lipid signaling plays a key role in regulating this trafficking pathway. So two graduate students, Paul Herman and Jeff Stack, characterized these mutants. And what they showed is that a defect in VPS15 or VPS34 results in a complete defect in vacuola protein sorting of carboxypeptidase Y. They also showed that this was a membrane-associated complex associated with the endosomal membrane, and that VPS15, the protein kinase, phosphorylates VPS34 to regulate its activity, and that VPS34 modifies a lipid on the cytoplasmic face of the endosomal membrane, converting a lipid phosphatidyl inositol to phosphatidyl inositol 3-phosphate. And this phosphorylated lipid is critical for the sorting reaction. So in a wild-type VPS34 kinase plus mutant, CPY is sorted to the vacuole. It's inside the cell. Whereas in a VPS34 kinase minus mutant, CPY is all secreted as the Golgi-modified P2 precursor form. So these are critical activities. Now, the question was, what is this lipid doing to regulate this process? And another postdoc in the lab, Chris Bird, was able to identify effector proteins that are recruited by the lipid and regulated through this lipid pathway. So there's a kinase, BPS34, that makes the PI3P, and I'm not going to discuss it, but there are phosphatases that can co convert this lipid back to phosphatidyl inositol. So Chris was able to define transport factors that directly bind to the head group of the, of the lipid in a stereospecific manner. And that binding was through a sequence domain called the five domain. And so these effectors are the proteins or the machinery that guides this process, and they're regulated through the formation of PI3 phosphate. Now to localize the lipid within cells, we took advantage of the green fluorescent protein. And fortunately, my lab at University of California, San Diego, was located just across the hall from Roger Chen. And Roger Chen had characterized and developed a whole variety of fluorescent proteins that could be used as reporters and tags for studying the localization of other proteins. And so a postdoc, Chris Steffen, in the lab generated fusions where GFP was attached to a domain called a pH domain, which binds selectively to the lipid PI45P2, and the 5 domain fused to a red fluorescent protein that binds to PI3P. The vacuole here is, is detected through a different fluorescence marker that's blue. As you can see, PI3P is highly enriched on these endosomal red dots within the cell, and PI45P2 is localized selectively and enriched at the plasma membrane. And these studies then led to another model for how lipids and phosphoinositides can regulate membrane trafficking in general. So PI3P is enriched on the endosomal membrane, 
It was found that PI4P is enriched on Golgi membranes. 4,5P2, as I showed you, is at the plasma membrane. And another lipid, 3,5P2, is enriched at the vacuolar lysosome. And both in yeast and in human cells, this forms what has been referred to as a lipid code for organelle identity, where these lipids function as tags on these membranes to identify them specifically for the binding and regulation of other proteins. So finally, I want to discuss the escort pathway and the production of the multifascicular body. So we had been initially characterizing mostly soluble proteins that are sorted to the vacuole lysosome. But we then switched to trying to look at the sorting of membrane proteins, specifically single pass transmembrane proteins, to see how they're directed to the vacuole. And a postdoc in the lab, Greg Odorizzi, first fused GFP to, the, to another protease called dipeptidyl aminopeptidase B and characterized its sorting. And what he found is, as we expected, the protein was localized to the vacuole and it was localized to just the limiting membrane of the vacuole, so you just see just these rings. Because of the size of the vacuole, we can section it optically in the microscope so you can see the, the ring form. And so this was consistent with what we assumed would be happening. These proteins would be transported as membrane proteins from the Golgi through a vesicle to the endosome and then from the endosome to the vacuole. The GFP is fused on the cytoplasmic side of the transmembrane protein. And due to the topology of these membrane transport reactions, it remains on the cytoplasmic face of that membrane. And so you see this ring. However, the surprise came when Greg fused GFP to another transmembrane protease called carboxypeptidase S. And instead of seeing it on the rim of the vacuole, we saw the GFP inside the lumen of the vacuole. And here, the vacuole membrane is being marked by another tag for that membrane. This was unexpected and indeed was the kind of result that triggers a lot of thought as to what mechanisms might be involved. And I would call this a real eureka moment for us because I remember vividly sitting in my office with Greg as we contemplated why this one protease, DPAPB, would be sorted to the rim, the limiting membrane, while CPS would be present in the lumen. And so this led us to propose a hypothesis that in the case of CPS, instead of sorting on the limiting membrane, it was being delivered to vesicles that bud from the surface of the endosome into the lumen of the endosome. And then these vesicles are delivered into the lumen of the vacuole where the hydrolases could break it down, releasing the GFP and giving rise to this diffuse green signal within the vacuole lumen. This model, of course, reminded me immediately of a Gordon Conference, a meeting that I was at many years earlier in 1985. And at that meeting, I met and talked with Stanley Cohen, who was at Vanderbilt at that time. And Stanley Cohen had been studying a growth factor receptor, the epidermal growth factor receptor. And, we, and he presented work on the trafficking of this growth factor receptor. And indeed, a year after this meeting, he was awarded the Nobel Prize for that work. And here is a simple sketch that was from his Nobel lecture in 1986, where he described the EGF receptor being endocytosed from the plasma membrane and then being sorted into the lumen of the endosome, so-called a multifascicular body. In this way, the cell can downregulate and inactivate the growth factor receptor. This fit, fit very nicely with the result that we had, but because we were working within this genetic system, we could potentially describe the molecular mechanism for this pathway. And so the question was, how do cells generate these small vesicles and invaginations? And we set out to use genetics to identify the genes and machinery that drive this process. So I'm not gonna go through the approaches that we used. However, we were able to define a, a large number of genes that when mutated interfered with the delivery of the GFP-CPS protein to the lumen of the vacuole. 
And so in wild type cells, as I just showed you, the fusion protein goes to the lumen, so you see this bright green patch where the vacuoles are. However, in these mutants, and I'm just showing one of them, VPS4 here, instead of the, it being in the lumen, it's on the limiting membrane, which indicated that the protein could no longer be sorted into these vesicles that invaginate into the endosome. And indeed, in these mutants, not only did we see the signal on the limiting membrane of the vacuole, but we also observed some aberrant endosome-like compartments, and they're seen as these bright green dots next to the vacuole. So in parallel studies, another postdoc in the lab, Beverly Wendland and Michael McCaffrey, had been doing electron microscopy work on yeast cells where the hydrolases within the vacuole lumen are defective. In these mutants, we could suddenly visualize small vesicles that were being stabilized in the lumen of the vacuole. And these 25 to 30 nanometer vesicles were the likely candidates for the vesicles that were sorting this carboxypeptidase S protein. In the mutants defective for the sorting in the electron microscope like VPS4, we observed that the vesicles were completely missing and there was an abnormal structure near the vacuole, which later we could show was an abnormal endosome. And so this indicated that these mutants are specifically required for the generation of these vesicles that invaginate at the endosome to form the multivesicular body. These mutants ultimately became the escort mutants, and that, stood, that stands for endosomal sorting complex required for transport because they function to escort proteins into the lumen of the organelle. Now, without going through years of work to characterize these, several postdocs in the lab working together purified and biochemically characterized the various gene products that we had identified through genetics. And by doing that, they identified a series of protein complexes that we called the escort complexes that were required for this process. And they are called escort zero, escort one, escort two, escort three. And the only enzyme in the pathway was an ATPase, a AAA ATPase, the VPS4 complex. Now, there was great interest in this work and very rapidly a number of laboratories got involved with solving crystal structures for these different complexes. And so in these simple diagrams here, it shows the organization and structure of the escort 0, 1, 2, and 3, as well as the VPS4 hexamer ring complex. And the laboratories of Jim Hurley, Roger Williams, Wes Sundquist, Chris Hill, and Winfried Weisenhorn were key players in solving these protein structures. Now, because of the function of these proteins in the downregulation of growth factor receptors like the epidermal growth factor receptor, as well as in the turnover of other proteins, it was not surprising that escort defective genes were detected in individuals with various neurodegenerative diseases. So the VPS2 escort mutant is associated with FTD. The, the VPS2, another allele, was associated with ALS and defects in several of the VPS genes in the escort pathways, VPS 37 and VPS 23, are associated with various forms of cancer, liver, breast, ovarian, or prostate cancers. So these play a critical function within the cell. So based on all of this work back in 2008, based on the genetics and the biochemistry, we developed a model to explain how this pathway might work on the surface of the endosome. And I haven't described to you yet, but the proteins that are sorted through this pathway are ubiquitinated, modified by a small molecule called ubiquitin on the cytoplasmic side of the membrane. And this functions as a critical tag for the recognition of these proteins by the escort machinery. And in addition, as I mentioned, the lipid phosphatidylinositol 3 phosphate is on this membrane, and this also plays a key role in this pathway blocking the ubiquitination step or the lipid phosphorylation step completely blocks the escort pathway. So we found that these escort protein complexes function in an orderly sequential fashion, such that escort zero docks directly onto the ubiquitin on the cargo proteins and through a five domain onto the lipid PI3 phosphate. 
escort zero through the tail of one of the, the VPS27 protein is able to recruit the escort one complex, a large protein complex that is recruited both to escort zero and binds to ubiquinated proteins in the membrane. Escort one recruits escort two, and escort two can both bind ubiquitin on cargo as well as the lipid PI3 phosphate. Escort two then recruits a set of small molecules that describe the escort three proteins. And these are monomeric proteins that co-assemble on the surface of the endosome and generate a filament-like structure. And escort three plays a, a central role in driving this process. Escort three recruits the ATPase called VPS4 and also recruits the a, a deubiquitinating enzyme that removes the ubiquitin before these proteins are sorted into the lumen of the endosome. And this indicated that escort three plays a critical role in sequestering these cargo on the surface of the membrane. But ultimately, VPS4, the AAA ATPase, is recruited, and this assists in modifying the architecture of the escort three complex in some way that allows a vesicle to invaginate and ultimately undergo fission and release into the lumen. And finally, the VPS4 protein drives through an ATPase reaction the disassembly of these complexes and the release from the surface such that they can recycle and function through the pathway again. Now, by making specific mutants in different escort complexes, we could show that if you block the function of escort two, then escort zero and escort one are still recruited to the membrane but nothing beyond that. Similarly, if we block a function late in the pathway like escort three, the escort zero, one, and two complexes are recruited, but, that's, but the reaction stops. And finally, if we make mutations in the ATPase VPS4, all of the complexes get recruited to the membrane, but you do not undergo the formation of the vesicles. So we knew that escort three was a critical component, but how can it sequester cargo? This linear hypothesis that I'm showing you from 2008 does not provide a satisfying explanation for how the cargo would be sequestered. So two postdocs in the lab, Mike Henney and Nick Bukovich, reconstituted the assembly of the escort three proteins on the surface of lipid monolayers and then analyzed them in the electron microscope. And the single escort three protein, VPS32, was able to form filaments that formed spirals on the membrane. These spirals were tightly attached to the membrane and in this way could potentially surround and encircle the cargo and thereby trap it prior to formation of the invaginating vesicle. And so this was a satisfying result. But they went on to add other escort three proteins and those escort three proteins were able to change the architecture of these structures so that instead of getting flat spirals on the membrane, we now generated helical structures that could potentially change the membrane in a way that's visualized here. So we envisioned that when these structures form on the membrane, they could drive the invagination or deformation of the membrane, pushing the cargo into small vesicles that would bud into the, into the membrane and generate these internal MVV vesicles. VPS4, the ATPase, could be recruited then and finish the reaction by remodeling this structure to allow fission to occur and then ultimate release and recycling of these proteins. So finally, to generate detailed uh, understanding of how escort three works, we began to look at, do structural studies on escort three. And a graduate student in the lab, Stephen Tang, was critical for this work. So structures of escort three had already been described, but it was a so-called closed tight form that was soluble as a monomer within the cytoplasm. Through the, through the mutagenesis work that we did, we were able to generate activated forms of escort three, and Stephen Tang was able to solve the crystal structure of one of these activated forms, which is refer we refer to as the open form. So as you can see, the structure he solved was a dramatically different opened form of this molecule. 
And in the crystal structure, the assembly of these proteins could be seen as a lateral side-by-side -side assembly. And this is visualized here in a schematic on the surface of a membrane. And so we envisioned that the escort 3 proteins can form filaments through this opening and side-by-side -side interaction and thereby surround the cargo on the surface of the membrane and ultimately deform the membrane to generate the vesicles. Now Janet Iwasa at the University of Utah made this very nice animation to try and describe this process of forming these invaginated vesicles. Here the escort one and two proteins are recruited to the cargo in red, and then the escort three proteins are co-assembling on the surface of the endosome, and the different colors corresponding to different escort three proteins assembling into these flat spirals. Ultimately, these spirals undergo conformational changes, forming a kind of corkscrew that the VPS4 protein can remodel and thereby allow the formation of a vesicle that buds into the lumen. And so this provides a simple way to visualize what might be happening. Clearly, there are numerous questions that remain to be solved, but this provides us at least with a, a, a simple hypothesis for how this process might occur. Now, to finish, I want to comment on the unique topology of this reaction. So in cl the classical pathways of protein secretion and protein endocytosis in these green squares, vesicles bud from the endoplasmic reticulum or the Golgi, and they bud into the cytoplasm. In endocytosis, similarly, the vesicles bud from the plasma membrane budding into the cytoplasm. But in the formation of the multivesicular body by the escort machinery, the vesicles bud in the topologically opposite direction out of the cytoplasm into the lumen of this organelle. And although both of these processes generate vesicles, because of this topological dif difference, the mechanism is drastically different. So in classical vesicle budding, like secretion and endocytosis, there are coats that form on the surface of the membrane deforming the membrane as it buds into the cytoplasm. However, in multivesicular body formation, the escort machinery also is in the cytoplasm, so it cannot form a coat on the luminal side, and so it must drive vesicle formation from the opposite side of the membrane. Now, while we were doing this work, Wes Sundquist at the University of Utah was characterizing the budding of the virus HIV. And HIV buds from the plasma membrane, generating these structures that ultimately get released out of the cell. What he found is that the gag protein, a critical structural protein of the virus, can recruit and bind to escort one, and in this way is able to recruit the escort apparatus to the virus. And indeed, when they blocked the function of escort one through RNAi techniques, the virus is no longer budded out of the plasma membrane, but accumulated as these partially budded forms of the virus. And so they showed that escort one is not only required for the formation of the multivesicular body that I just described, but also for the budding of HIV, as well as other envelope viruses. Interestingly, as you can see, the budding of the virus is topologically very similar to the formation of vesicles at the multivesicular body. Here, the membrane is being deformed out of the cytoplasm, out of the cell as the virus buds. This analysis revealed a number of other functions that might use the escort machinery. So as I just described, there's multivesicular body formation and viral budding. But there are other reactions that are topologically similar, including cytokinesis where we have two cells and this same kind of structure that needs to be uh, closed and undergo fission during cell division. And Juan Martin Serrano's lab revealed that the escort machinery is also required for this reaction. In addition, after cell division, with the, when the nucleus reforms and the membranes come together, the escort machinery is also required for closure and reformation of the nuclear envelope that surrounds the nuclear uh, DNA.
Finally, it's been shown over the past several years that the formation of another class of vesicles, the exosome vesicles or extracellular vesicles, requires escort function. And indeed, when the plasma membrane is damaged and small holes are generated, wound healing of the plasma membrane or wound repair also uses the escorts. And finally, it's been shown that in the remodeling of neurons, the escorts are required for the pruning of these structures. And so I want to close by just pointing out that in this analysis of the escort pathway, we found that the escorts sort ubiquitin membrane cargo and drive a unique membrane curvature reaction required for MVB formation, HIV budding, cytokinesis, nuclear envelope reformation, exosome formation, plasma membrane repair, and neuronal pruning. And that's where the field stands today. To close, I want to once again recognize and thank the many members of my laboratory that participated in the, in the work. I also want to recognize many colleagues who I've worked side by side with over the years and provided important insights in the work here at the University of California, San Diego, and at Cornell. I also want to recognize my colleagues in the Weill Institute for Cell and Molecular Biology, who I've been working with over the past several years and had several productive collaborations. And finally, I want to recognize my family, and I cannot easily put into words how important they have been to me. Uh, I show a picture here in 1998 when we were all together. Our two children are now grown, married, and have their own careers, and I'm very proud of both of them. But I can't thank them enough for their love and support over all these years, and particularly my wife, Michelle, who uh, has been my strongest advocate and support. And so I'll close there and, and thank you for your attention, and I'll open the talk for questions. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Emmer, for the enlightening lecture. We will now open the floor for questions. If you have any questions for Professor Emmer, please type it in the Q&A box. Our moderator will read out your questions out and facilitate this session. Hey, thanks, Professor Emmer, for the very wonderful talk. So now there is some questions raised by the audience. So I will just, uh, uh, just uh, select uh, some of the questions for you to. So there is a general question uh, raised by Gil Oman. He says that, um, how similar are pathways in humans? And Lee Hardwell and uh, Gil Oman like to say, is little human. So are you agree? <laughs> this is a general question, yeah. So yeah, how Certainly, uh, sir, I thank you for the question. And uh, certainly we consider yeast a wonderful model or little human. For, for what happens uh, in human cells. And indeed, the, all of the machinery that I talked about in the, in the lecture, the VPS 34 PI3 kinase pathway, as well as all of the escort machinery uh, are also contained in human cells and similar pathways have been characterized with that machinery in human cells. Thanks, <laughs> thanks for your answer. So there is a second question raised by a student called Zhou Xin. She, she asked uh, uh, whether is, if PI4P also plays a role in MVP formation. Is it possible that MVP form directly from the trans or GLT gene? Is it for, there's two questions. PI, whether PI4P is important for MVP formation and whether the MVP can form directly from the trans or gene, not from the, from, from, yeah. Yes. From, yeah. So again, thank you for uh, that question. So PI4 phosphate plays a central role in trafficking through the Golgi complex. And since the, the proteins that I mentioned in the lecture do pass through the Golgi complex, PI4P can have an effect on their trafficking. Uh, as regards how you form the endosome or this uh, matured endosome called the multifascicular body, uh, this is mediated through vesicles that actually bud from the trans Golgi and are transported to an endosome and as those membranes accumulate, you build this endosomal compartment. And there's a number of other VPS genes that regulate the process of both forward and recycling traffic from this organelle. But I didn't talk about those things in the lecture. Okay. And there is another question raised by a, a student that asked, uh, 
uh, does S code assembly to form, uh, sorry, oh, here. So does S code assembly to form different sizes of helix, uh, you know, based on the different cellular cells or different cellular processes that they are involved? This is a, uh, when they yeah, the kind of spiral complex, you know, the, the size of a spiral, is that different from different species or different cellular? <laughs> yes, yeah, this is another uh, wonderful question that uh, hasn't been fully addressed as to whether or not the spirals and the corkscrew structures that are generated by the escort three filaments, whether they're all architecturally the same or can they be of different sizes? And indeed, there are escort components in certain bacteria like archaea, and those escort components play a role in cytokinesis or the cell division of bacteria. And in that case, you form much larger uh, filament rings that surround the cell a micron across that then have to close and generate the two cells during cell division. So there probably are many different architectures in different organisms. Oh, okay. There is also a very interesting question raised by uh, Xiao Wei Chen from Beijing University. So he, he asked, uh, can you tell us a bit more about the content of the vesicle, especially whether there are selective cargoes in, enclosed in the lumen, generate, uh, sorry, just going up, uh, gen generated toward the lumen of the lysosome. Are there different type class of vesicles? That's uh, Xiao Wei's question. <laughs> yeah, yes, Xiaowei. yes. So, so again, uh, this is a good question and, and additional research is gonna be ultimately required to fully address it. Uh, but what we've seen in yeast is that if you block the escort machinery by knocking out uh, these genes, uh, we'd no longer see vesicles forming. And so we assume that the formation of the vesicles is all mediated by escorts. However, there could be different classes of vesicles depending on if different components of the escort machinery are used more or less in certain pathways. And so we don't know the answer. If there are some vesicles that carry one set of cargos and another set of vesicles that have a different set of cargos, we haven't been able to, to address that. Oh, okay, that is also a very important question, actually, very important for all of us. And there is a professor ask uh, any advice to our young students for scientific career? <laughs> so that's, uh, yeah, I also want to hear your advice. <laughs> so any advice to our young students for a scientific career? Yeah, certainly the the, it's, it's work hard, um, don't get discouraged when things don't go right. There's a lot of failure that we deal with in science and uh, just um, try to plug through those failures. And you have to just have that passion and love for doing research and stick with it. Okay, so there is also a question uh, asking a very interesting question because of COVID. So the SARS COVID COVID two virus can also when they do assemble in the host cells, they induce the uh, when they assemble in they also induce the invagination of the membrane of the allergic membranes to form the form in order for them to assemble in in the in the host cell. So do you think this process also need the S code machinery? The, the topology is also similar to to the HIV, but they invaginate in the allergic membrane uh, based on our current understanding. So do you think this process also needs the urgent um, escort machinery for the, I'm sorry. Yeah. Yes, so there are similarities, of course, because both viruses, HIV and SARS, are envelope viruses. They are surrounded by a membrane. However, HIV, as I showed, uh, buds from the plasma membrane and clearly requires the escort machinery. In the case of SARS, it occurs intracellularly at the urgent compartment. And there's, I think, conflicting evidence at this point in time as to whether the escorts are absolutely required, partially required, or not required. And so that's ongoing research, not in our lab, but in other labs. Okay. So um, there is a question about, um, there is a, okay, so let me just, uh, well, so what is the force driving the escort complex to do the closure job? Yeah, that's uh, also in, so how the vesicles really pinched off from the endosomal membrane? So this is a, a, a student ask. <laughs> yeah, I, I can see that there are some wonderful students in the audience who, <laughs> yeah. who can predict. They can predict every good experiment that needs to be done. So how do you get the final mixture of the membranes at the fission event is a wonderful question. We don't know the answer. The assumption is that as the escort spiral 
narrows and forms this corkscrew that at the tip of that corkscrew, you bring the membranes within close enough proximity that the lipid bilayers begin to mix and you get a fission event. But I'm just speculating. We, we don't have direct evidence. And these are all experiments that will need to be done. Okay. Uh, there is also a question raised from a student in my lab that he, he asked, uh, you know, the COP2 machinery, like when they form the vesicle from the ER, looks like there is not much sophisticated machinery for the fit for the scission or, you know, they just uh, the code assemble on the membranes from the vesicles. But when the final step of the scission of the COP2 is not, uh, do you think there is an other machinery regulating this process for the COP2 vesicle to be released from the ER membrane eventually? <laughs> yes, yes. So yes, in the case of other coats like COP, like COP2 at the endoplasmic reticulum, uh, the final fission event is still, you know, somewhat of an open question. Okay. In the case of COP2, one assumes that other proteins that are associated with COP2, like the SAR protein that's inserted into the membrane, that that may contribute to destabilizing the lip lipid bilayer potentially in a way with, that would assist in that final fission event. Okay. But uh, okay. I don't think anyone knows for sure. Okay, so our department head, Professor Xie Ting, as uh, mentioned that on behalf of the, our division and Professor She want to extend our warm well uh, congratulations to you. <laughs> yeah, and also uh, and Professor She enjoyed your uh, your like a fantastic and inspiring lecture. So there is a question raised by Professor She. So since VPS genes are involved in age-related neuronal degenerative diseases, how does aging impact on escort machinery? Yeah, so the role of the escorts uh, during aging uh, we, we don't have you know, direct evidence of, of how they participate, but it's very likely that they do uh, help to maintain good health and, and long life because not only do the escorts generate these multifascicular bodies, but they also play a key role in sorting damaged proteins, damaged membrane proteins that need to be turned over in the lysosome. And so this is a major pathway for quality control of membrane proteins and defects in the escort system would lead to the accumulation of these damaged and potentially toxic proteins in the cell, which of course would not be good for the cell or for the person. Okay, thanks. Okay, so there is also a, a very uh, interesting question so that she asked uh, from a student. So he, he asked, do you think the escort protein could be the target of, for treatment of HIV or similar virus? Or do you feel any modifications on its function would be uh, fatal to the cell? That's a question raised by a student. <laughs> yes, yes, another good question and uh, something that many people have considered and some people have even looked for drugs that interfere with escort function potentially as a treatment for, for HIV infections. And But as the uh, person realizes, as I indicated, these proteins function in so many different pathways, you know, including cell division at cytokinesis, in term nuclear closure following cell division. So these are all very essential pathways to the cell. And so if you completely inhibit the escorts, uh, you're going to result in numerous cellular problems. And so it's unlikely that inhibiting the escorts would be a useful therapeutic uh, tool. Indeed, if you knock out an escort gene in a mouse, uh, it's lethal during embryo formation. Okay, so there is uh, so many questions I need to choose. So there is a question raised by Bruce Hamilton. Hamilton. So he asked, uh, the time scale must be very fast for such a large complex. Can you estimate the degree of cooperability, cooperability, co cooperativity required for the assembly of the escort three helixes, the cooperation efforts, and the degree of cooperation for assembly of this escort three? <laughs> Yes, yeah, so, so work in other labs, not in my own lab, uh, have been trying to analyze the kinetics of these reactions on monolayer membranes uh, using atomic force microscopy. And I don't know the exact time frame, but as the, uh, as, uh, the person has asked, um, it looks like it's, it's very fast. Probably the escort three assembly reaction takes seconds. 30 seconds, 20 seconds, something in that range. Oh, wow. Okay, there is a student I know that working on an exome secretion. So he asked that MVB is important for the for the for generating the exosomes, so extracellular vesicles. So do you think the escort machinery play a role in this process 
And do you think this escort machinery also regulates the sorting of cargo into exosomal, into extracellular vesicles in addition to this uh, uh, va vacuolar sorting? Yeah. <laughs> so. Yeah, this is another major area of research in terms of what is the function of these exosome compartments, which are basically multivesicular bodies that fuse with the plasma membrane and release the vesicles out of the cell or extracellular vesicles, which can form directly at the plasma membrane by budding of small vesicles out of the plasma membrane, uh, also likely mediated by the escort machinery. So I assume, yes, that the escorts play a key role in packaging of the cargo, but exactly if there's other machinery, which is very likely that uh, supplements escort function to select the appropriate cargo is very likely, and we don't know those components. Okay, oh, thank you. So uh, there is uh, also uh, another question from a, a faculty in our division, Professor Huang Pinbo. He asked, uh, how important is a lipid composition in different cell types for determining the cell surface expression of membrane proteins? Uh, yes, so uh, I'll, I'll interpret that question in terms of how lipids participate potentially in forming these multivesicular bodies and generating uh, the vesicles. And, and this is something that my lab is just beginning to look at is in terms of what, what's the lipid composition and how does it regulate both the formation of the vesicles as well as the selection of the cargo that gets packaged in the vesicles. It's very likely that lipids play an important role, but it hasn't been analyzed in detail. Okay, uh, sorry, there's so many questions. So another student, uh, a graduate student I know that asked a question that you really think is important for so many degradation processes, the proteasome degradation, other degradation. So is there any format of the ubiquitin chain? Do you think that the escort machinery, because they're so, they use a similar ubiquitin recognition, do you think that the escort the machinery can recognize a specific form, format of the ubiquitin chain for the recognition of cargo? <laughs> yeah. Yes, good. I, I, an excellent insight from that <laughs> student. So it turns out, and I couldn't go through it in the lecture, but uh, the proteasome, this large, uh, protease complex in cells, turns over lots of proteins in the cytoplasm. And those proteins are recognized by ubiquitin chains that have linkages between the ubiquitins in which the lysine at position 48 is linked from one ubiquitin uh, to another. And in the case of the escort pathway, the linkage between the ubiquitins is not via the K48 lysine, but the linkage is through the K63 the lysine. And so it's a different linkage and the escort machinery can selectively detect that linkage and not the K48 linkage. Oh, there is a very interesting question. Now it's the last question, Professor Emerson, because the time is approaching. So that he asked whether there is some organism that don't have escort machinery and how do they digest their, uh, send their material to lysosome or for, the, for this purpose? Yeah, is there any uh, organism that don't have the escort machinery? Do we know? Yeah, that's yeah, another uh, good question. Uh, my understanding is that all eukaryotic cells have some of the either part or all of the escort machinery, but there are some bacteria that do not have the escort machinery. And bacteria uh, prokaryotes don't have these internal organelles. And so only a subclass of bacteria use the escorts for cell division while other bacteria have different machinery for doing cell division. And so that, those are the only organisms I know that, that uh, might not have the escorts. Okay, so thank you again, Professor Emma, for answering this question. There's so many questions left, but the time is approaching. So, and, and thank you for answering this question and for the great presentation. It was a pleasure to have you with us. So Professor Emma, is there anything else you wanted to cover before a wrap up? Well, I just want to thank the Shaw Foundation again for the recognition uh, by the Shaw Prize. I also want to thank Hong Kong University of Science and Technology for sponsoring the lecture and inviting me to give this lecture. And finally, I want to thank uh, all of those that are in person there in Hong Kong. Thank you for coming to the lecture. And I also want to thank those who are watching it remotely for joining in. This has been a wonderful experience that I really appreciate. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Ermer and Professor Guo. And thank you all for attending today's webinar. This lecture is now over. Thanks again for joining us today. 